Happy spooky season. I wanted to do this video on body snatching law as like a fun spooky season themed video. But as I was researching, I learned that instead of just being a kooky old timey thing, it is in fact, as with most US history, deeply steeped in racism. Turns out the history of body snatching and the eventual laws that put an end to it is an opportunity to discuss another way in which racism has manifested itself throughout US history. Let me first draw some distinctions. There's body snatching, but then there's also grave robbing where the body is buried with valuables and thieves come and dig the valuables up. This has long been illegal and is an issue that continues to this day. There is also tension between grave robbing and archeology. span We call it grave robbing when white people's stuff is stolen, but archeology span when we dig up, for example, indigenous burial grounds. That's a discussion for another day. In this video, I'm talking straight body snatching where the body itself would be taken, not the valuables that it was buried with. In the 1800s, medical research and schooling was expanding. Students were gaining new understandings of how the body and disease functioned. The first stethoscope was invented in 1816. The first blood transfusion was performed in 1818. Aspirin was discovered in 1829. And the antiseptic theory, the idea that washing your hands and your instruments during surgery is probably a good idea, that was developed in 1867. With this increased understanding of the body and growing interest in further developing the medical field came the need for bodies, lots of bodies. But first, a quick note about today's sponsor. Thank you to my partner on today's video, Scribd. Y'all, I just upgraded to an iPhone 14 and it is easier than ever to spend all day just scrolling on my phone. What's great about Scribd is that for just $11.99 a month, you get access to a huge library of content, including millions of eBooks, audiobooks, podcasts, and magazine articles right at your fingertips. Whether you're looking for your new favorite murder mystery novel, listening to the latest news on your favorite podcasts, or if you love a good audio memoir, who doesn't? Scribd Scribd has literally millions of resources to explore. I've recently been trying to hit the gym on the daily and I'm taking my dog Moira for walks all the time. So having a huge variety of podcasts and audiobooks to choose from makes even an indoor treadmill walk feel pretty thrilling. And honestly, what I love is there's no complicated credits or additional costs. You just pay one monthly subscription fee and then you get full access across all of your devices. So make the most of your screen time with Scribd. You can get a two month trial for only 99 cents using the link in the description below. Try.scribd.com slash Leija. That's two whole months to test drive the world's most fascinating library for less than $1. Just go to try.scribd.com slash Leija. Thanks, Scribd. So the med students and doctors needed bodies. In the 1800s, common punishment for criminal activity was execution followed by dissection for science. So it wasn't a noble or charitable thing to donate your body to science as we see it today. It was punishment akin to desecration. For example, in 1788, a riot of New York doctors was sparked when reports surfaced that a white woman's body had been stolen for dissection. It was an act so repulsive that people took to the streets when it happened to a white woman. Seven people died during that that riot and more than a dozen other similar riots related to body snatching occurred during the late 1700s and early 1800s. However, even though people were being executed left and right in 1800s America, the growing need for scientific knowledge via investigating the human body meant that there just weren't enough cadavers to go around. For example, in Baltimore, 1200 medical students had to share a total of 49 bodies that had been legally obtained. So snatching recently buried corpses became became the norm. But if doctors and med students learned anything from the 1788 New York doctors riots, it's that their safety and reputation depended on them robbing the right graves, those of the poor and marginalized, especially black bodies. A number of factors worked in their favor to ensure that doctors and med students were able to remove black bodies from graves easily with little to no consequence. First, of course, was racism. People with the power to write laws or enforce laws didn't have a problem with grave robbing if the bodies being snatched were black. While often technically a misdemeanor, cops frequently looked the other way. The second factor was that cemeteries at the time were segregated, with black cemeteries often on the edges of towns and cities, away from churchyards and in areas easy to enter without being noticed. 
Also, potter's fields, graves for poor people, and unclaimed bodies usually had a deep trench dug out to fit numerous pine coffins with only a thin layer of dirt covering the coffins until the trench was finally filled, at which point the trench would then be properly packed and covered. So these half-filled trenches of bodies were easily accessible, and the penalties for stealing the body of a poor person, especially a poor black person, were pretty much non-existent. And finally, lawyers at the time got creative, arguing that since the previous occupant of the body has since vacated it, ownership is questionable at best. There's no victim here. He vacated it. Finders keepers. There's no victim, there's no crime. And as with all things in capitalism, where there's a need, a business will fill the demand. And thus, trafficking in human bodies was a lucrative practice in the 1800s, especially in places like Baltimore, where the temperate winters meant that digging up fresh graves was much easier than in the frigid Midwest and New England. Med students weren't taking anatomy classes in the summer, they were in class during the fall and winter. The creation of the U.S. railway system meant that a body could be dug up in Maryland and sent to Massachusetts relatively easily. Those bodies that were transported via train were often stored in barrels filled with whiskey to mask the smell. The leftover whiskey then sold to bar patrons as an extra stiff drink. The methods by which professional body snatchers, also known as resurrectionists, obtained bodies were either through potter's graves, as I've already mentioned, or in a traditional grave, they wouldn't dig up the whole coffin, as you'd imagine, and as is often depicted. No, no. In order to go unnoticed, they would dig a narrow tunnel at the head of the grave, break into the coffin, and then tie a rope or hook around the neck or arms of the body, and then pull it out through the narrow hole. They would then do their best to fill the hole back up so that the grave appeared undisturbed. They would also throw any clothes or belongings back into the grave before closing it up because resurrectionists believed themselves to be different than grave robbers who were the ones who broke into the graves to find the valuables that the people were buried with. Now, of course, resurrectionists targeted black and poor bodies because they were easiest, but the practice was so common that no one truly felt their recently deceased loved one was safe from being snatched. So many tactics were developed to thwart would-be body snatchers. People would put cages on top of the graves, use iron coffins, or fill the graves with heavy stones. Wealthier people would even hire guards to look over the bodies until they had been buried long enough that body snatchers likely wouldn't come for them. They wanted only the freshest of corpses, of course. But even the wealthy and famous weren't immune to body snatching. In 1878, John Scott Harrison, a congressman and the son of President William Henry Harrison, died. His family buried him in a heavy vault and covered it in large rocks. Even so, the day of his funeral, it was discovered that his body had already been snatched. It was later found hanging on a hook at the Ohio Medical College in Cincinnati. Now, even though the authorities tended to look the other way, there were sometimes acts that were too foul even for the authorities to ignore. One trend called burking luckily didn't take hold in the U.S. quite in the way that it did abroad, where a man named Edward Burke gave burking its name when he murdered 16 people in Scotland and sold their bodies for profit. There is one recorded instance of a trial for burking in the U.S., and this one, of course, has racial undercurrents as well. In 1886, a 28-year-old black man named John T. Ross hit a white woman over the head with a brick killing her. He then sold her body for $15. That woman was named Ellen Brown. She was 60, and she had drifted to Baltimore at the age of 50, panhandled her way around town, and was addicted to alcohol, morphine, and opium. She took a room in the black neighborhood called Pig Alley, where all the slaughterhouses were located, and John T. Ross, her murderer, was the son of the woman who owned the black boarding house where Ellen had been rooming. Ross was eventually found guilty of her murder and hanged. So the laws were clear on one thing. You you definitely couldn't create the bodies yourself through murder, especially if you're a black man murdering a white woman. But what did the laws say about taking bodies that were already dead? As I've already said, dissection of bodies after death was seen in the 17 and 1800s as an additional form of punishment meant only for criminals after they were already executed for their crimes. So the earliest laws around human dissection in the U.S. actually revolved around dissection of criminals or as further punishment for crimes committed in life. For example, in 
1784. Massachusetts law required that a slain duelist would be either buried in a public place without a coffin, with a stake driven through his body, or given to a surgeon for dissection. The only federal law pertaining to cadaver supply was passed in 1790 and gave federal judges the right to add dissection to the sentence of death for murder. After the Edward Burke trial in Scotland, remember he lured people to his lodging house and killed 16 of them and then sold their bodies for profit, he was found guilty, hanged, dissected, and put on display. After that, the UK passed the Anatomy Act, allowing for unclaimed bodies to be used by medical students. Massachusetts followed suit with a similar law in 1831. After the body snatching incident involving John Scott Harrison, the son of a former president, a number of states passed similar laws outlawing body snatching and giving unclaimed bodies to science. Other states followed suit, and by the early 1900s, most states had passed similar laws. Apparently, there were so many unclaimed bodies that this severely lowered the need for body snatching. It wasn't until 1968 that the Uniform Anatomy Gift Act was passed on a federal level, getting rid of the patchwork of legislation across the country and allowing for donors to bequeath their bodies to medical study, codifying the new trend that saw dissection not as punishment or desecration, but as a charitable act. Thank you once again to my partner on today's video, Scribd. Reminder that you can get a two month trial for only 99 cents using the link in the description below, try.scribd.com slash Legia. If you enjoyed this and want to support my work, bringing you videos like this, please consider becoming a member of this channel or joining me over on Patreon, where we have a lively Discord chat, Leech's book club, behind the scenes stuff, and so much more. Thank you especially to newest Patreon supporters, Helen Hunt on Wheels, Travis Willette, Nathan, and Tay. And as always, thank you to my royal patrons, Old Man Pence, Fork McSpoon, LNL, Daniel Taylor, and Lita M. Thomas. And a very special thank you to my multi-platinum patrons, Brett Piantek and Cyrus Solka. Your generosity is greatly appreciated and it makes this channel what it is. So thank you. If you liked this video, you might also like this special spooky season playlist I've made of all my past spooky season videos. My last one was about the dead Pope trial at 897. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye.